Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for inviting me here to speak. I'm going to try and speak slowly and not in Australian, which is very <laughs> fast. Um, I thought one of the areas that I do research in is uh, big team research where we work with, I work very closely with psychologists, also medical specialists, uh, audiologists, things like this. Uh, and today, presenting most of the work I've been doing with uh, psychological research. It does show some of my other interests. I also teach uh, functional anatomy, actually, so you've had a lot of anatomy now. And it's very interesting the ways that anatomy can be affected by how you hold your instrument, where you position it, if you're stressed, if you have pain, if you're tired. There's many, many things that change this. So uh, this is... This can be a very good thing, it can also be a bad thing, and we'll talk a little bit about some of this, but uh, feel free to ask me about any of these other things. Um, I thought what I'd start with was, would be to talk a little bit about pain mechanisms because it's very important if we're going to talk about uh, psychology, how this interacts with pain. Um, and as a clinical physiotherapist, uh, we can't just treat the body of a musician. We need to look in a much bigger way, particularly with chronic pain. Uh, you've heard with the speakers today things like uh, acute injuries that can happen to the shoulder. Very often with musicians, we're dealing with very long-standing uh, problems and dealing with more chronic pain issues, which necessarily involves psychological aspects. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about... Um, how the psychology and physical factors interact uh, and some of the risk factors we see and what we're trying to do in uh, educating young musicians and, and also although I work a lot with professional musicians uh, clinically this is um, something I've done for a long time and also in research so I really work across the age range. Um, in this picture we have on the top <laughs> left corner there, the original idea of what, when, when people started realising that pain had this central processing um, ability, so you put your hand on the fire and something in your brain tells you to pull your finger out. Uh, since that time we've learnt a lot, that it's actually, this is, if you like, the first case, this primary thing that if you um, put something on your hand or you hit your finger, you would try and remove it. But it becomes more complicated than that. Pain has a lot of uh, other effects. Um, so we can be affected by mood, how often we're facing it, um, tiredness, all sorts of other things affect our pain perception. <coughs> and I think the big thing to remember is that if you turn to your neighbour now and said, hey, I've got pain in my shoulder, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. <laughs> you can't actually do this. So pain is not a, a concrete thing. You can't say, hey, do you mind just looking after my pain for a while? I'll just put it over there. <laughs> we can't actually do this. So it means that pain is a very complicated thing. It's, it's an interpretation by your body and mind of various sensations it's, it's facing. Again, this is a good and a bad thing, but it's an important thing because... Uh, pain can have very different uh, inputs that we need to work on with different uh, situations. And when we look at it in a sort of simplistic way, often with musicians the brain is telling us to move or act or, or take strategies that's trying to protect us from hurting ourselves more or feeling more pain. Uh, when we have pain that's there for a long time, these strategies become more pronounced and more... Uh, almost exaggerated that people will really actively avoid things or move in different ways when they play their instrument or do all sorts of things uh, in a way that's very exaggerated. Uh, the thing I look a lot at, is, as well as stress effects on the way muscles move, um, I look at how pain affects movement patterns, fatigue affects it. Uh, they, these things are so interwoven, it's a really interesting and complicated thing to look at together. Uh, but as I said, I, I, with, even with professionals, I see quite a lot of international soloists actually who have little niggling problems and don't know who to see, who can try and help work with them back to, I guess, having a, a very um, 
perfect technique, if you like. I mean, they're under a, a lot of load, they're doing a lot of playing, and very often a very small percentage of inefficiency in the system can create a significant problem for these people. And actually, I would say to you too, when we go through this, um, they trust me, they know me. Uh, trust is a very interesting thing when they are dealing, when, when music and health professionals are working together, um, then we can, they, they already feel that you are going to look at their situation. So stress, worry, fear all directly change how we, how we experience pain. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is we always say that pain is not normal, that you shouldn't all be sitting here in extreme pain at the moment, but when we're doing something at a high level, it happens often. So, for example, in musicians, I, as I said, I work with many orchestras and I don't think I could really pick maybe on one hand the people who have never had pain. <laughs> it's, it's just very common when you do something at this elite level. What we want to do is make sure that it's managed well. It, it's not something that's associated with stigma or catastrophes or, or a crisis. We want to try and make sure it's managed well and prevent it wherever we can. There's many ways we can still do better in prevention, whether it's psychologically induced symptoms or physically. There's not uh, a lot of groundwork often in that area. Uh, other things we know, it's very difficult to measure. We use, we use uh, certain simplistic things like our ratings out of 10, but you know, like we'd say, is your pain zero out of 10, 10 out of 10, but this really depends on your interpretation of, of what 10 out of 10 pain is. Uh, your past experience will make a very big difference. You'll be perhaps very fearful this pain might have a bigger, mag bigger magnitude because you associate it with other things. Uh, your beliefs about pain, again, this can be complicated. <coughs> And it's, of course, not just a physical thing, so um, it, it's a very influential area. So when we have pain that's persisting, we're getting these vicious cycles of pain, um, and this is, this is something that we're, as I said, often dealing with, with musicians, is that what often happens is our, our brain uh, panics somewhat, it goes into this survival mode, and we do these reactions that are not uh, necessarily consciously thought out. So we do things to try and avoid the pain. Um, once we uh, do these strategies, often these coping strategies will work for a while. We've had discussions about things like subacromial impingement. Maybe for a while they just try dropping their arm if they're playing the violin, they start to run out of space, they, they, they try and adapt strategies that work in the short term, but perhaps aren't ideal long term. And of course, uh, pain can be, this, this happens quite commonly in musicians, even the worry about an upcoming uh, musical piece might trigger pain already because it's been associated with uh, problems in the past. Uh, this is uh, not uncommon at all. And, um, of course, when we have chronic pain, uh, the neurologist I'm working with at the moment says it's like a light shining on this pain, creating a shadow, making the effects bigger, so we have a stronger effect. So, sorry, this all came out together, but I just in the background, we know that if we talk back about our head, neck and shoulder, I'm speaking quite uh, generally here, but we know that stress affects head, neck and shoulder pain. This is very well established in uh, working workplace literature. Um, we also, there's, there's an interesting amount of research at the moment going on about this perceived stress. Uh, we use sometimes, or some of my research has used perceived exertion, perceived stress, this, this kind of idea of trying to get a sense of how that uh, relates to pain because we think it's important. Uh, another, another area that I do quite a lot of research in is electromyography, so it's looking at the way muscles move during uh, musical tasks, and we see very clearly that the presence of pain changes this. Um, for example, in the shoulder, we've talked a lot about um, shoulder blade uh, muscles and how important the position of the shoulder blade is for, for example, rotator cuff function, uh, things like this. When you have chronic pain in the neck 
and shoulder region, this appears to completely change your, the way the muscles work around the shoulder blade. So we have actually deactivation of these shoulder blade stabilizers and, and our muscle activity tends to move further away from the center. So we get this very altered uh, movement response to pain. Uh, if we have stress, we also get a, a different kind of response to pain. One thing that we see a lot, particularly in this neck and shoulder region, is that if you have stress, you tend to have resting levels of muscle activity. Uh, I, I think it was probably back 20 years ago that I first accidentally <laughs> looked at this. So one good thing with doing research is sometimes you find things out by mistake. Um, but with violinists, I was getting them to play these pieces of music and uh, applying different postural effects. But what was interesting to me is we had put in a rest a rest phase during this piece they were playing. And the musicians, these were professional musicians, even if they took their violin down, a lot of them, particularly the ones with pain, did not relax their shoulders. They put it down, didn't relax. And the interesting thing was the only ones who did seem to have a, a strategy. They put the violin down and shifted or, or did a movement that just helped them turn off that muscle activity. Since that time, I've looked at this a lot, and you'll see this static tension, you know, uh, especially with professionals or higher level students will sit there with their muscles, especially these upper trapezius and muscles like this, activated at about 10%, just doing nothing. This is, this is quite an important uh, issue because if they're playing all day, uh, you know, they have their four to six hours, say, on average, that they're playing per day. You can't afford to be just burning up this kind of uh, muscle activity um, sitting there at rest in your, in your lectures. And they're often not aware of, they're not aware of this. They have this kind of um, vicious cycle of activation. Um, work rest ratios. Uh, we had some um, information on this with the last speaker talking with Laura Cox's work, looking at students and sudden increases in playing time uh, and things like this. this. This is, again, a very important thing that when we do this um, lack, of, lack of appropriate rest breaks, again, we get this uh, potentiating of muscle activity. And the thing I'm going to talk a little bit now is about what we think might be happening with the autonomic nervous system. This is... The body has uh, various nervous systems, I guess. You have voluntary ones where you can send a message to muscles. It, it gets uh, messages in from the periphery. This one's more or less our uh, automatic one, so it reacts to stress or it calms us down. For example, after a big meal, it sends uh, energy more to our stomach or more impulses to our stomach to help us digest and away from things like muscles. But it has quite a big impact on stress and uh, with chronic pain and stress, and we've been seeing this in some of our research. So, just as a brief, sorry about this graph. It's a bit busy, but it's just saying what we what we have with pain is we have some kind of stressor, whether it's physical or psychological, that creates a problem. There's predisposing factors to this. Um, some of these are not clear, but sometimes it's genetics. Sometimes you have other conditions like obsessive compulsive disorder, for example, in musicians or perfectionistic traits. Uh, it can be related to, as the last speaker said, being female or being younger or even older sometimes has a reverse effect. Uh, all these sort of things can make a difference. We, we get a physiological response and in, in medicine, we'd say at this first response, if it's, uh, something happens, you get a, a pathological response, something goes wrong, you get pain or, or a muscle tear or something um, that results in pain. If we did the right thing straight away, if we, if we took an appropriate action, we would go down this green path and very often get rid of pain quite quickly. The problem is in music, we don't see that a lot. <laughs> we see a lot more going down the, the other pathway. And, and some of this is cultural. So some of what I'm going to talk about with the psychological aspects is what we're finding is that attitudes within the music environment, like this perception that you should tough it out, you should be 
should be strong, you know, and pain is just for wimps. We, we all have pain because we're musicians. Um, also, you know, our professional musicians, the most common thing for dealing with pain is to play more. You know, you still have this, so it's not really necessarily looking at why you have pain. It's just hoping if you ignore it, it will go away. Um, often, uh, lack of sleep and fatigue and stress are all potentiating factors here. Very often, um, they don't see someone early enough. Often, they're not sure that you know what you're doing. To be honest, when they see a health professional, they're, they're not sure if you're just going to tell them to stop playing. This, this is a kind of old-fashioned notion in a way just to completely stop playing. Musicians are very scared you're going to say this rather than looking at how things could be modified. Uh, in some cases, perhaps, it has to stop. But this will stop them going to health professionals because they think you're all just going to say, well, don't play. It's a very simple answer to your problem. Um, and when we get those prolonged stimulus to the system, we get the body starting to react with the sympathetic nervous system overstimulation. So, and, and this kind of ties into these chronic pain cycles. So what sort of things have happened with sympathetic nervous system? We see these kind of, uh, often they're hyperventilating, increases in heart rate, these kind of symptoms before they're going to play, particularly in a performance situation. We see um, very big movement pattern changes. So I've been, um, <laughs> sounds very mean, but we've been trying to induce stress in an ethical way <laughs> in our musicians uh, to see what happens. Um, it's... It's interesting to watch because what we see mostly, to summarise it, is that muscle activity goes to the, the business end, so the face or the fingers. Uh, and it's interesting with some of our conditions we see, like focal dystonia, like I'm working on at the moment, where, where we have this hypertonic kind of reaction in the hands or the face. Um, and this seems to happen very much, very quickly with stress, with stress responses. Um, we're also seeing now earlier fatigue changes when we when we have uh, chronic pain, and this is tied into this um, sympathetic nervous system thing as well. So I, I guess coming to the main point of this, we need to often rebalance this. This the the, the idea that they need to do strategies to work on uh, uh, decreasing the sympathetic nervous system um, overload, and obviously like we. It depends on which country you're in. We might think, well, that's easy. There's lots of relaxation techniques, but do you find musicians doing this uh, as usual? Do they know which ones to do? Some of them do very well. Other ones are not sure what to do and, and kind of hide or, or take some kind of medication to block it, whether it's alcohol or illicit drugs or uh, beta blockers or so forth. Um, this sensory motor control... Uh, every time we're looking at people, say, for example, with dystonia, you always have to assess the psychological component uh, as well as uh, the physical imbalances with this. It's, it's almost never not both things that you're dealing with. Um, why are the musicians particularly <coughs> at increased risk of problems relating to psychology and pain? Uh, we've had a lot of discussion on this. We have some unnatural, uneven kind of positions that can lead to central imbalances. If we're imbalanced centrally, what the other speakers have said is right, uh, we will put more stress on other structures trying to compensate as we um, go more into these imbalances. Uh, we also have very fast movements. There's not many um, tasks that you have in other everyday life that's as fast or as complicated. Uh, I'm doing quite a lot of research on embouchure at the moment, so the, the facial muscle um, things we're doing. And what other things are we doing in, in human life where you blow into that kind of resistance and then you're moving your tongue fast or doing various other things? It's a very unusual activity and very quick, very precise, and a whole lot of things adding together. And this is a high load on the brain. On top of that, we have to look good, you know, have to sound good. Everything's important. It's funny, there was a picture of Anne Sophie Mutu before, and I, one thing with working with professionals, I'm quite lucky, I meet lots of these people, and it's funny because even when you show someone like her that looks elegant, it's a very considered strategy. She's a smart musician, you know, she doesn't like her shoulders to be 
restricted. So she always wears these topless dresses. This is intentional. She doesn't want her shoulders to be hampered. She doesn't use a shoulder rest. She doesn't like this. So she has a more flat position of her instrument. Uh, these things are all very considered and intentional. Um, again, this has implications on anatomy, whether you hold instruments this way, this way, you know, it, it kind of changes what we're going to use quite apart from pain and stress, which can interfere with it. Uh, one thing I'm doing at the moment with a big international group is looking at this concept of health literacy. This is um, across health. This is not just a music thing. This is something we're very interested at the moment with preventable medicine, if you like, preventing disease and thinking, do people understand what to do if they get pain? Do people understand what they can do to prevent this? And uh, in music in general, this is considered to be a bit of an issue because what does your average musician do uh, in a perfectly, uh, I guess, natural way if they have a problem? What do they normally do? Who do they ask? Teaching. Teaching, right? Every time they ask their music teacher. The music teacher feels like, like you know, they're their mentor. They will try and give them advice to the best of their capacity. Um, I, I really don't meet any that I think are intending to do harm, but they feel they're trying to help in some way. But often it's quite a long process before they get to the to the health people, and, and the music teachers themselves haven't often had much health education. Some have had a lot, some have had little. They're just trying to do their best. So, so we have this sort of problem with management. Um, and also, of course, you're in a hotbed of competition. There's many, many people around you that are competing for the same jobs. And um, I work at our National Performance Academy, so their students don't have to do any academic work. They just play and they play. And, they play. and there's this competitive environment, you know, that if you're not using a certain amount of hours in the practice room, you know, you're not going to make it. They have this in their head that it's quantity, not quality. And we've, we spend a lot of time actually trying to educate them on quality of practice, not just quantity. And, of course... This is the same thing. They, they can feel these mentors um, can give them some tough goals too. I would say master classes are a very interesting case. Sometimes you you go to a master class and this um, very fantastic musician is telling you you should change everything. <laughs> it all needs to be different, and they will go. The students will go to their practice room and do ten hours a day of this. I should change everything, I should change everything, even though they've done many years of very fine work. It, it can be a very, um, it, it can be less helpful than we would like. Um, I think you can always get pearls of wisdom from these people, but, but to do this kind of really crazy, radical strategies is, is not healthy, I think. So we end up with this burnout kind of thing. And um, it's interesting, even with burnout, which we worry about, whether it's physical or psychological, um, there's this discussion with this with music teachers even, that when you do a music education training or you decide to go into music education, perhaps rather than performing, they have these terms like praxis shock, where they say, you know, you're not in any way prepared for, for the kind of realities of running from school to school and different chairs and different instruments and, and all the stress of doing this. So we have a lot of things that are, are moving towards burnout. So the kind of um, musicians' health problems are, if you like, if we simplify the vast majority of them, they tend to fall into two main camps. We have the anxiety related uh, problems. And there are really a lot of types. We have obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. So this can be after a bad audition, um, uh, many bad uh, negative performance experiences have been shown to have quite a, um, a big effect on ongoing anxiety. Generalised anxiety disorder, um, panic attacks, this can happen to anyone. Uh, and music performance anxiety, in the end, which, is, which is the more common one. Um, it's very common that the, some of these are mixed up together. You, you have a, a tendency towards perfectionism and you're more inclined then to have anxiety. This is, this is also reported. So this is the um, 
typical definition of uh, music performance anxiety. And we do see very different ways that people express it um, and the way that people will react. I must say I tour, I tour internationally with orchestras. My job is to keep them playing. <laughs> and um, I, it's, I always call this Carnegie Hall syndrome. I think there's some thing when you go to play in Carnegie Hall that makes musicians go crazy. Um, and well, the last time I was there, one of the French horn players completely, uh, really lost it. And he said the riser, the riser was like four centimetres too tall. He couldn't be expected to play. He just, but, but it wasn't really the riser being four centimetres too tall. He just had a complete uh, panic attack, anxiety related thing. And it turns out he'd had a negative experience in Carnegie Hall before. And so he just really panicked. So. It's funny being on the road with musicians, you find you're very often just trying to uh, keep things calm. The other thing with anxiety, um, that, or the other opposite, if you like, problem that happens is depression. So we get a lot of uh, depressive disorders, often not necessarily related to playing. You can have these underlying kind of forms of depression anyway. Or uh, actually, uh, at the, one of the areas of interest with this can be things like when you get a position to study with the teacher you want to study, often you move countries or move cities, you're away from your friends, you often have very little money, um, you, you might have trouble getting the right sort of food to eat. There's all sorts of stress, plus you're studying with this teacher that's, you know, your, your idol. And there's all these pressures of trying to please them. So sometimes they can get quite depressed, not, not managing to kind of uh, keep, all, keep everything together. Um, this is, these two conditions require very different management. <laughs> I'm saying this because you'll see in a minute the kind of uh, strategies musicians will use. They very often share beta blockers around like, I don't know, chocolate or something. And... If you're depressed and you take beta blockers, this is not a good idea. A beta blocker is a depressant of sort. And, and we found in our study, we looked at all the orchestras in Australia, we found that more than a third of people taking beta blockers were depressed, not actually uh, suffering from anxiety. And this is, this is very important. So if people are having ongoing psychological symptoms, they do need to have the right, uh, the right management. That's just the pharmacological side. Very often they don't have other strategies that, that can help. They just don't get taught these. And, and there's many things that can help that we'll go through in a minute. I'm not going to talk to this side other than... We can't really say, I will just, you know, tie this and tighten this muscle or, or open your arm and sew this tendon back together or, or I'll give your shoulder a rub, you'll be fine in the morning. Like it, it's not really quite like that because usually they will be playing differently to avoid the pain. Usually they'll be actually really scared about whether they're going to be able to play again. Um, one of the international soloists said to me recently, I'm just terrified that if this little thing gets worse, that's it, my career's gone. I don't know what to do, and they, they don't know who to talk to about these things. But there's a lot of things that um, feed into pain. And neck and shoulder pain, too, just as another, when we did our national orchestra study looking at professional musicians in Australia, it was the most common area of pain, neck, shoulder, followed by hands. Um, and it also was the poorest recovery. So shoulder problems on the whole, uh, only 20% of them got properly better. Uh, neck was about 25%. So the most common injuries were the worst recovered injuries too. Like they sort of got them to a point where they could get by and play again, but they weren't actually recovered from their from their problems. So this means that they're worrying. They've still got a little niggle there. They're getting more worried. They're trying to change what they do to not aggravate it. We have the, the, the statistics are very complicated to um, <laughs> uh, fully understand the way. I, I think it probably could also be said for physical symptoms. It depends what tool you use to measure it. It depends a bit on the, the population sample that you have. I've just picked a couple. One, because the English 
uh, studies have been done sort of through musicians, health unions and societies, quite big numbers. And so having some interesting kind of uh, statistics, there are very high levels of people having anxiety problems and panic attacks. And um, a lot of them felt the mental health services weren't uh, sufficient. I think, well, from my experience in Australia, we don't have very many music psychologists. We have sports psychologists that are trying to help musicians and, and it's somewhat improving, but it, it can be very difficult uh, to find the right fit, someone who really understands what you do. And in Germany, it's just quite a, quite a big group showing very high levels of anxiety here. I certainly see it in some of the clinical load we're having. There's a lot of uh, stress and anxiety um, in these players. Um, this, I'm sorry to put a list there again, but I think you can um, see the typical thing that we've already talked a little bit about, the beliefs you have, the mood you're in, uh, these things that can change um, a lot. I think the lack of healthcare utilisation we would say is a risk because, for example, you're taking the wrong medication for your problem or you're just drinking yourself uh, through it, so to speak. Um, yeah, we actually had one issue on tour where a particularly stressed musician was becoming so drunk before they came on stage. It created quite a, I don't know, tour catastrophe in the middle of it. But, um, you know, it's not the way to deal with, with your anxiety. Um, one study I did with uh, Diana Kenny, who's a music performance anxiety specialist, we look at the relationship between pain. We use this trigger point and the upper trapezius and related this back to their um, psychological variables and we found an absolutely linear positive relationship. The more pain you felt here, the more likely you were to be anxious and stressed. We can't say which way it went. Uh, maybe you were stressed because you had this pain. Maybe you got this pain because you were stressed. We can't say for sure. Uh, one thing that was interesting, though, is we found men with very high anxiety had lower. <laughs> this particular group had a lower score here, but there's this theory that um, we have up there, this somaticizing. So, so you you kind of internalize your your stress concerns, and this seems to be more of a male a male thing to try and hide it and internalize internalize stress. Um, now, I, as I said before, I want to talk a bit about psychosocial risk factors too because, again, working within the different environments that I've been working in, like music schools or professional institutions, uh, like various orchestras and things, the, the environment really, really changes. And this can be down to an orchestra section. I mean, I don't know how many of you work with orchestras, but if you have a section leader who's not so personable, shall we say, <laughs> or less friendly section leader, you'll find this section has real problems. Like they, you, you can pick it. You know, people will say, oh, I want to go for this percussion job in this orchestra. And you think, good luck. <laughs> but, but so you can have these very interesting cases. Also, workplace attitudes. So for our study where we, did, where we were working with eight different orchestras, in the country, the management attitudes will make a big difference to whether the musicians feel they're able to participate in, in healthy behaviours. There's this kind of institutional stress that flows down. And uh, I was working earlier this year in a music institution with a psychologist again and working on actually a problem-solving tool for music students, which uh, is currently um, being submitted. But... It was to try and give music students a fairly clear idea of what stage they were on uh, of problems so they could act. And the music students liked it and the music teachers liked it and the music institution panicked. <laughs> if people saw this, they might start uh, talking about problems and think that they know the problems are there. It's, it's not actually going to work anymore to, to hide this. You know, we, we're trying to say, actually, if they catch it early, you won't get the really terrible problems uh, a lot of the time. Um, support from each other. I, I used to say when I went into an orchestra, you know, like if someone had an injury and actually spoke about it, 
there was a tendency for other players to treat them a bit like they had leprosy or something, you know, I think in the green room, it's like, don't talk to them, they've got tender margins, you know, and I, I think I keep saying to musicians, well, look, all of you will overdo it from time to time. Maybe it's because of what's happening in other aspects of your life and just did too much or you had another gig, but be nice to each other because... This will happen and just accept that you need to reflect on what caused this, try not to do this again or try and take appropriate behaviour, but support each other. Don't don't uh, ostracise each other or, or exclude each other. This is not going to help someone heal. Um, other things that are difficult, in, particularly in professional situations, is you don't have a lot of choice about what you do. Um, you know, you play, you do an up bow when you're told to do an up bow, you sit where you're told to sit. There's all sorts of things like this that can be quite stressful over time for musicians. <coughs> uh, very often musicians will play in other uh, small groups or whatever to try and uh, get some enjoyment in other aspects. They can, they can find it tricky in orchestra sometimes. Um, and I think these interpersonal work relationships are a bit tricky. I, I try to get the orchestras to consider like things like management training for leaders of sections just to help them because this could be my perspective, but very often the, the, the principal player is the person who's probably spent the most time alone in a room by themselves, <laughs> not, not necessarily the person who knows how to deal with people. That can be fantastic or not. I mean, why would you necessarily have this skill? Um, and the orchestra management's not necessarily caring about this. They just want them to play well. You know, they, they said to me quite clearly, yeah, but they're there because they're a good player, you know. And so we still have to kind of struggle with these issues a little bit. So a bit like conductors. Conductors really can get away with things sometimes because of who they are. But I think at the moment there's, there's a bit of a spotlight on them and behaving uh, better, which is, which is good. Um, I think, yeah, this, this is, there are areas that we can still improve on. Oh, sorry, I got some of these slides on. This, this, this top bit here was from our, most of this actually is from the research uh, we did with the orchestras in Australia. What was interesting is we found that with music performance anxiety, the younger females were really, really vulnerable, like had a very high uh, rate of anxiety. They felt really scrutinised by everyone in the section. It, it, um, it was a very obvious risk factor coming into the orchestra where we've suggested to the orchestras they should consider mentorship or some kind of thing where it just it takes this kind of feeling that everyone's uh, against you out of their mindset. And on the opposite end, which is actually quite different to Germany, um, is that our older musicians were completely relaxed. They were fine, they didn't have a problem. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case in Germany. The older musicians seem to really have more anxiety problems. It's a little hard to completely understand the difference. Again, cultural reasons perhaps, but... So at home, we seem to have this survivor phenomenon. If you get to 55, you can just relax. Um, whereas here, it's not, it's not like that. Um, and then we have these uh, common causes of performance arousal that you can see there. Interestingly, the worst thing is your own pressure on yourself. You know, you think this is important to realize, you know, you don't want to be your own worst enemy up there. You have to have some strategies to try and um, and manage how you uh, are facing the world. Um, interestingly, um, some of the work now in performance psychology has been doing things like teaching people how to accept that if you make a mistake, it's not it's not the end of the world. You know, you want to do as well as you can, but learning how to deal with things like, like this kind of thing. I would say also uh, often people don't necessarily start in the right uh, body and mind state. Like I think for us as physios, we would like people to be somewhat warm and ready to play before they play. And I keep saying this is a great time to get yourself in a psychological zone, get your body ready, mind ready, and uh, you will be in a better state to play. Um, yeah, so we've seen some of these other things. Uh, Yoshi, the one at the bottom there, he looked at piano players and found that stress caused this increase in muscle tone in forearm muscles in 
piano players. And as I said, we've seen the same thing with flute players, violin players, uh, as well in some of our research. So this, this stress causes a complete change in how you use your muscles. Um, this is not, uh, I, I think this is interesting just in our study what we found was that when we look at what musicians think are the worst problems, like we have this sort of muscle tension, muscle fatigue thing. It's a little bit hard. We ask these questions and don't know what we, <laughs> don't know what we mean when we ask them. <laughs> I guess it's, it's trying to say like, do they feel that they're tense? Do they feel they're fatiguing quicker? Um, both of these things could be argued to be either physical or psychological, we don't, we don't exactly know. But we have this whole first part that's related to load, like, like how much they're playing, this work-rest ratio again, sudden increases, not enough rest. I think um, this poor posture thing, I think musicians are, are hyper aware of posture, um, so they, they're aware that this can cause a lot of stress. And then we had stress which came under a fairly general category, then they realised they didn't know what to do if they had problems. We, again, have done interventional research on this and they, they just don't know who to see. They don't know what's wrong. They don't know whether they should play more, not at all, panic. You know, this educational side is very important. And then uh, performance anxiety. So it's funny when you look at uh, the things that are causing problems, there's a lot coming back to this um, psychological and physical stress. I, I, I started out my research life as a very quantitative researcher, the way we get trained in Australia, it's science, it's randomised control trials, blah, 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 blah. and then you think, but it doesn't always explain your results. So I do much more mixed method research now, trying to understand why our results might be this way. So a lot of science mixed in with things like semi-structured interviews and things like this. So with some of these... Um, when we talk to musicians within their orchestral workplace who have problems, this is what they say. It's a sign of weakness, you've failed. What a lot of, I mean, who here has heard saying, oh, they have pain, they must have a bad technique? Mm -hmm. well, I mean, this is, this is a stigma immediately. You say you have pain, that means everyone thinks you have a bad technique. This is, this is quite silly, but um, it's not, I always say to them, well, if something hurts, you might change the way you're playing to avoid it. This, like you're not in a professional orchestra because you have a bad technique. There, there may be in injury implications or stress implications, but this is not a helpful way to think about it. Um, I also went to uh, academic specialist school and a music specialist school. So uh, in Australia we have these, I don't know, do you have this in Germany? You probably have these gymnasium or something that are Music. focused. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I went to the two different schools and actually I was talking to the parents because I wanted to see what they thought about um, how they how their kids were experiencing music. The, the academic school had a very big music program. That's why I chose this particular one. So very big uh, band program. And it was so different. So the, the parents in the academic school, all of them said, no, their children should not have pain. No, they shouldn't have stress. You know, they, they shouldn't have these problems related to playing. Whereas as soon as you went to the music school, the parents went, yeah, sure, they'll have pain. They'll have stress. This is part of playing and it's a little bit concerning that it's it's not that there won't be these issues faced but the way they talked about them was a bit um, resigned to the fact not not looking at it like well we should we should be making sure that we're doing things in the in the school to try and minimize these problems from happening some kind of education or like compulsory earplugs in the band room for example or things like that. there's all sorts of uh, stresses that are there that could be fixed. Um, and, and we found in our study that uptake of uh, interventions, we offered a lot of things over six years, and the management determined how much the musicians would participate and um, the kind of complete health response. You could see a very strong top-down effect. So this is, again, very important to, to recognise. Um, I put in some quotes here because, again, I uh, talk, because I work so much with musicians, I think it's interesting what they're saying to me, that, you know, that you say, oh, you shouldn't play through pain, and they go, what are you talking about? I've been studying for, I'm playing for 35 years, I've had 
A zillion episodes of pain, when do I see someone, when do I not? Again, this is often an educational thing or having an accessible advisory person. And um, the, the kind of stress side, this exposed profession, you know, you're going up on stage playing in front of 5,000 people every night or whatever in an orchestra. Uh, and one of my um, quite good friends said to me, he was trying to play through this uh, lateral epicondalgia and said, well, it's not like I can have a bad day. I'm a casual musician. I've got to take every gig. You know, this is important. Um, often people will feel this, so they hide them until they can't. <coughs> this no pain, no gain thing. Oh, it's, it's weird, you've seen it. I sort of have, oh, I've been a professional oboist for 20 years and I've had constant shoulder pain. Look at me go. And you think, no, oh, it's not necessary, but if you like this. <laughs> um, and then the stigma, I've worked a lot on trying to reduce stigma and I think with all of us we can work a lot on this and say, you're doing something that's incredibly physically and psychologically demanding, it's completely normal that things might from time to time overload in some way, there are ways to deal with this, there's things we can do or you can do to make this better. And um, actually this kind of, you see this particularly with ambush problems, <laughs> we just pick on that group, is that they will often take a, even though musicians in Australia who know me will often take a year to ring me about it because brass pedagogy in particular, it's like over-analysis is paralysis and they, they get very stressed about talking it to you because they can't think and play. And I, I always say, yeah, but you know, what we can do is work on whatever the issue is, whether it's coordination, strength, flexibility, and so on. And I actually agree, I don't think you should be thinking about contract contracting your orbicularis while you're performing. I don't think this is uh, actually what we want to see, but that's what practice is about. It's about getting things working right so that you can perform in a way where you're not uh, doing this. So trying to get them to trust a bit more with it. Um, We've talked a little bit about this. We asked the musicians what they uh, thought. We've uh, sort of had this uh, before about the kind of things that um, bother them. Um, I think these uh, negative evaluation, bad performance experiences really create these very dramatic kind of panic attacks often in later situations. But uh, being aware that pressure from their self themselves is, is the worst problem they're going to face is quite an enlightening thing to musicians. And, you know, I think you want the best for yourself. They're often perfectionists. I mean, you don't get to this level without having these high goals for yourself. Um, and in fact, in performance psychology, we often say you don't want to have these goals all the time up here. You want to have this approach to what you're doing that's more uh, realistic and within reasonable frame. The next slide, don't panic. <laughs> um, this is, we asked people what their actions were to alleviate anxiety and there's a whole lot of stuff there about what they did and some of the strategies were very good, I mean it took to number six to get to beta blockers, but I've got these arrows here because, um, you know, they're really not going to psychology specialists or even their GP about anxiety, they really feel they suffer alone. I, I get run by hysterical musicians quite commonly because they're saying, you know, this is happening and I'm the only one who feels this and I don't know what to do. And you think, no, no, you're not the only one. This is very normal, but you need to see these people and, and have some way to try and funnel them. But psychology, I think now in our industry, for example, where we've been talking, or I've been talking about this a lot for many years, you'll find people more likely to come up and talk to you about physical problems. But psychological problems, we still have quite a way to go. It's, it's a very uh, hidden taboo kind of subject. Um, we've started trying to educate that there are nice things, talking about how to warn people about psychological distress. We're trying to tell music educators about this if they notice this in their students to maybe open the floor for discussion and say, hey, is everything okay? You know, are you feeling all right? Um, so we, we sort of notice a change in their behavior, either agitation or, or depression. Um, 
often they'll cry at the drop of the hat or get angry or other sort of emotional outbursts. Um, they're not sleeping properly. Uh, we've had problems at our National Performance Academy with anorexia, things like this. You'll see other expressions of anxiety. And, and people will withdraw from social activities, stop going out, doing different things like this. You just need to uh, check things are okay. Obviously, substance abuse is a big one we see. Um, if they're uh, stressed about things or <coughs> And, and just these really obvious, like, different attitudes towards what, how much they're enjoying class. We've, uh, one student followed um, a group of musicians in Queensland Conservatorium over the course of their training, and, and we saw a really, sadly, negative change uh, in, the, in their behaviours and emotions because all of them were uh, becoming injured and having these kind of uh, interlaced depression problems. And then just briefly, we're... Performance psychology still is a field that we need to do a lot more with, so preventative measures. Like teach them how to do simple things, like whether it's um, proper practice planning, for example. It's amazing how few musicians uh, really practice in a way that makes sense with practice research. So it's sport in fine motor skills as well. There's been a lot of practice um, <coughs> research. So optimising practice, for example, one of the most important things is to highlight the strengths of your practice at the end of your practice session. And most musicians will pull out the weakness and think, oh my gosh, I keep missing that note. And not think, actually, the other, you know, 40 minutes was super and I just have this area that I need to focus on next time and try and do more on. Um, so, so the way people practice uh, an intensity-driven practice, if you're practicing something really vigorous, practice a shorter session, you know, it does not matter if you've booked the room for one hour, <laughs> just have a short break in the middle because you can, this has been, I think, my biggest success in the National Performance Academy is getting piano players to take breaks. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's a, but it's, um, it's, it's sort of because you're saying with this piece, you know, it's a different physiological load on your system. You're just not going to play it better by banging away at it for an hour. You're going to play it better to do two shorter sessions and have a bit of a recovery break, and um, this has been helpful. Um, so there's other uh, sort of interactive things. Cognitive behaviour therapy can help with these past negative experiences or... Other factors, it's quite a traditional therapy. Um, this, this is more, um, I, I don't know, almost more recent, this uh, EMDR. It's, it can be very effective. It's quite a, um, a, people say it's a very strong technique, like you have to um, have this done by a very well-trained person. It can be quite disruptive. A lot of musicians like mindfulness. I think it is sensible in the sense it has a lot of different arms to mindfulness, so you learn how to uh, better um, not live by goals, but maybe your values, to meditate, to organise. Like there's all sorts of facets of mindfulness that can help. Um, and then we have pharmacological interventions. It's certainly something that should be carefully managed by someone other than your mate in the green room. Um, it should be something that's quite carefully watched. And dosages are so different between people. I've been at many dinner parties with musicians comparing how many beta blockers or how many, I don't know, sixteenths of a beta blocker they take. Um, it, it varies a lot. And education, I think, is still like some people are doing, like here. It's really the cornerstone to feel a bit empowered that you know what to do if you have problems. There's, uh, we put an online website where we have a very big psychological part. This is the sound performance one with a whole lot of worksheets and things they can work through. The second one, Tame the Beast, it's an Australian, um, a friend of mine actually has this free online website that describes the way pain changes if it becomes chronic and, and it really decatastrophizes pain. It's quite a nice, simple, user-friendly um, way to understand pain. Um, so just to finish, one of my students um, did this for part of his PhD. He was just trying to say, you know, we can't look at a person, uh, like say for a, physio, a physiotherapist, if I'm just looking at the physical body 
I'm very often not going to be able to solve the problem unless I look at these other factors, whether it's in a team, which is fantastic if you have a team around you, or, or referring out to the appropriate other people as you need to, to try and make sure that people get uh, the exact help they need. And yes, thank you for dealing with my German. And, uh, <laughs>